This is the Lydian Spin, as always, coming at you. Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl. Greetings, my friend. Greetings. Um, I hope uh, you're doing well. Things like everything seems like everyone around me is really kind of more active than they have been in years in terms of just the world and things to do. And it's well, uh, you, you know me. Yeah. Well, you always stay busy, but it's it's but if there's other moving parts that besides ourselves. Well, that, that's that. Let's get them going. You know, how about not too many people were moving uh, this week when the aviation systems computer well, somehow broke morning. down. I mean, oh, my gosh. Uh, I mean, the thing is, it's they don't know what caused it. The systems are probably old. But it reminds me of this great book I read, self-published by this guy, Rodney Stitch. And it was called Defrauding America. And he was supposed to be an aviation watchdog under Reagan right before they're deregulating everything. And every time he would try to troubleshoot, they would just shut him down. And eventually, uh, because he was like, hey, there's a lot of problems here, they did what they often do to people who complain in the FBI or the CIA. They just imprisoned him. He was going through a divorce. They got on the wife's side. He was imprisoned? He was imprisoned for bullshit. Is that uh, before the air traffic control was all fired by Reagan? That was right around the right time. Around and time. so okay. he, but he self published, and the book is called Defrauding America. So I'm just, uh, it's called Defrauding America Encyclopedia of Secret Operations by the CIA, DEA, and other covert agencies. And he had to, of course, self publish it. So anyway, wow. just something I thought I'd put out there because, uh, you know, we have some flights coming up soon and hopefully uh, they'll get it. I mean, Re Reagan's mass deregulation is it, oh, it's really, uh, the seed to so many reasons why we're at the place we're at right now. And the list is too long. Um, I had, uh, so I'm kind of like, I, I had, I, it's kind of embarrassing. I hadn't been to the dentist in, oh. in 25. But you've you never have cavities. Well, so, so I, I hadn't been in 25 years, 25 years. And the, and the dentist, they're like, oh, when's, when's the last time you went? You know, they did x-rays, the whole fucking thing. I was like, it's been a while. Because, you know, I don't want to be up. You're going to try to upsell me some crap, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, turns out I still don't have any cavities. Per <laughs> perfect, perfect teeth. I, I don't know what's um, going on. And amazing. Yes. Yeah, she, she was pretty impressed. She's like, what? Well, you know, I say if you're going to check one end, you might as well check the other. So you better get your finger up there and see what's going on on the backside <laughs> to make sure you don't have any cavities up there. Oh, God. Well, you, I do have I mean, you better cavity. check. Well, you better check that cavity and hope there's no teeth growing up there. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yuck. Well. I don't know if you've heard about this. I mean, we've all heard about the Bermuda Triangle, but have you heard mm -hmm. about the Alaska Triangle? I have not. 32,000 square miles, okay, in, in Alaska, and a very uh, rough terrain, vast forests, frozen tundras, you know, my, mountains. But since 1988, over 16,000 people have disappeared without a trace. When traveling well, through that area, well, you know, those those bush pilots, as they call them, um, uh, they're often single or, or two engine planes. And the, and the weather conditions can be really insane. Um, I mean, Canada, uh, northern Canada, um, Alaska and a lot of those pilots, they're really well trained. I mean, most of them are, are uh, military uh, vets uh, because, you know, they could go into commercial airlines, but that's just like a drone. It's not exciting. They kind of like they miss the action. So. But they're going into pretty turbulent and dangerous weather yeah. conditions. Well, I mean, even, you know, a House Majority Leader at one point, Hale Boggs, disappeared. That was in 1972. But so, I mean, at this point, you know, they just don't know what's going on. That's a rate of two. Look, a lot of people disappear in this country all the time. Just, just catch up with your forensics. It's an outlandish amount of people just going into their own Bermuda Triangle. But that's a. Uh, Two or three times the rate of the national average. The Alaskan Triangle, not going there. Not me. Well, uh, you're an adventurer. You've been to Alaska. I've been to Alaska. I've been to Northern Canada. It's, uh, it was my dad took us on these exotic trips. He wanted to show his boys these giant mammals that are about to be gone forever. He well, we've to heard see them about in their your element. <laughs> we've heard about your bear experiences. Well, before and actual bears, not <laughs> not ones you find. <laughs> in certain <laughs> neighborhoods. Well, and, but, and that's bizarre because there's a pretty good show on Hulu now called The Bear. It has nothing to do with bears, but it's about a guy that was working at like a Michelin star restaurant. It's a true story and decides to go back to save his family's sandwich shop in Chicago. And <laughs> it's really 
pretty interesting. Well, uh, Chicago. So this is going to be my little segue. I mean, carjacking is up all over the country. I mean, just come into a stop sign, a traffic light, and like three or four motherfuckers has come up with guns and they just get out of your car and they drive off with it. I, I guess chop shops are still in business. I don't know what. I mean, there's tracking devices on everything these days. I, I just don't know how this is working out. But uh, it's so Chicago, I mean, Long Island right now. It's in, in Nassau. It's really it's becoming a problem right. at, ga- at gas stations. New Orleans, though, it, it's all it's always competing. But then just from last year, it's up 150 percent. Oh, my. I mean, the thing is, driving around the city of New Orleans, I know you can't go very fast or very far at any one given time. So this is very. I, I think there, I think there's some corruption going on. I could be. Could yeah, be wrong. well. I mean, there's a lot of stupidity out there right now. And this one, I have a few stories <laughs> that might take the cake. Please. Georgia, Georgia police arrested a man and a woman. The man was wearing panties on his face. Cool. After an attempted robbery at a gas station. Oh, one of those. Uh, okay. Which, well, it was brought to a screeching halt by three armed customers. So <laughs> Sean Sutton and his partner, Melody Sutton, they stopped at a gas station on Old North Cut Road in Elijah, Georgia, and they walked into the store posing as customers, wanting the person purchase an energy drink. And then, you know, he goes inside. She stays in the car. But after he buys the drink, then he decides to pull up a pair of women's panties around his neck to cover his face. Goes behind the counter. Okay. Points a 45 at the clerk's head and demands money. Now, where was it again? Where was it again? Elijah, Georgia. So Georgia, an open carry state. Yeah. And a customer inside the store who was carrying a pistol took out his handgun to try and stop the robbery. Then a second customer went to his car to get his own pistol. Oh, my God. And then finally a third comes in. And uh, once uh, Sean Sutton was disarmed, the first customer told the other two not to shoot him. Let's call the cops. I well, that that was that was wise. But but well, he was white. No wonder they didn't shoot him. They, they, well, probably one of the big reasons. But the God, these people, the people, that's their fantasy. They can't wait to be in a situation like this and fortunately one of them <laughs> reasonable to say hey don't shoot the guy uh, um let's see here olivia dunn have you heard of this young lady I don't think so well um she's a gymnast for, oh yeah okay for, go ahead. for lsu and she's also she's Louisiana on, again. Yeah. Yeah. She's on TikTok or she's an influencer. Or whatever a lot shit. of fans. She's making two million a year. <laughs> I, mean, I should have stuck to the horse that I was on at 14. I mean, she, but, but she's like not doing not by doing flips. It's like, look at these jeans I bought today. That kind of yeah. shit. By doing but, pant, by doing panty slips. It's well, hopefully she can. Keep it together because it's starting to show there's signs of it backfiring a little bit. Right. Basically, droves <laughs> of insane frat boys are obsessed with her. And and it's it's kind of getting scary, like because usually at a, at a university gym, uh, I don't know, competition. Right. right. It, it, you can see the bleachers. You know, there's a few there's some parents there. You know, it's not like packing the stadiums. Well, now they're packed because of her. And there's these like frat boys in her. Well, uh, Olivia, they call her Livy, and they're going, Livy, you're the hottest, like kind of aggressive uh, and kind of sexually creepy like frat boys can be. And uh, uh, so she has to be like now she's and she's got money. So now she's being escorted with armed guards. So I, Pro- I the know. price of fame for wearing tight panties, I'm telling you. Well, and speaking about panties again. I, I don't know what's going on here. A Philadelphia police officer is being sued for sexual discrimination and creating a hostile work environment for allegedly taking off his pants repeatedly (laughs) in front of other officers. Now, Jose Donis, named as the defendant in a lawsuit, they both work, uh, uh, Kelly Neal is is put put the lawsuit up. Both officers work for the 26th District of Philadelphia. And the thing is, the guy who's Dones, a police officer for over 30 years would just continue to remove his pants directly behind and beside Kelly Neal on several again, stood in the open office in his boxer shorts and uh, just kept occurring. So they're like, you know, what is it? Is it Alzheimer's? What's he got? Dementia? Alzheimer? Oh, boy. I mean, and then, of course, he's fingering the crack of his buttocks. Oh, my to God. Wait, remove what's... his wedged underwear. 
Why would he? <laughs> well, you know, he gave I, himself yeah. a wedgie. Okay, we're going to quote. We're going to take it to the jury oh and see what they have to say about Mr. Fruit of the Loom, Neil's attorney, told the Inquirer. Uh, no, oh. Noting that both men and women have complained about his behavior. I mean, who wants to see an old man fingering his fucking wedgie? I, I, think, I, think, it's, I think it's dementia. I mean, that doesn't... That doesn't I mean, seem very after, reasonable, right? After 30 years on the police force, that's yeah. the least of his crimes, fingering his wedgie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I've just... <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've just... I've just <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... Why would he do well, that? Well, speaking about fucking the police, oh I gotta... Oh, wait a minute. I just lost what? this one. Hang on. All right. Uh, I gotta yeah, get yeah. this story up. Uh, oh, yeah. Here we go. This is good. Now we're still in the South. So speaking about fucking the police or police fucking, five officers were fired, three others suspended following sex scandal at police department in Tennessee. That's going to happen. uh, Officials in Tennessee City have fired five officers. Um, You know, the mayor of Levere near Nashville began investigating the department uh, after they got an anonymous uh, complaint letter and they started researching it and they found that uh well there were (laughs) the 60 person department now has 11 vacancies because they were shocked to find out that well five of them were having sex one was having sex a female with another one's wife and uh, and just and then sending out explicit photos and videos oh man (laughs) Yeah, you, you know, it's it's uh, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where my mother lives. I mean, it was really too bad because there was a a very progressive program at the police department where it was to help people with uh, heroin addiction. And they, even under Obama, he they got some national award. They're like, we're not going to throw you in jail. Just come and br- bring your drugs and we're going to help you through rehab. But then it turned you know, these cops started taking it. It was called like the angel program. It's these like young kids and these teenagers and these girls and then they started having sex with all of them and taking advantage of them and then it's basically ruined the whole program. Well, and you know, there was a gal at the center of this who was kind of the instigator and they were posting their own kind of like cops gone wild sex videos. <laughs> they had a house. They had a <laughs> one of them owns a houseboat at which a wild hot tub party was held. Oh, they boy. were drinking heavily. And at one point, the gal, the female officer, lost her top and had vodka poured down her throat. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that that's that's a party. Someone's that's what I'm saying. Their top and then someone has like a bottle of jug, like uh, forcing it down their throat. I, I want to see that. Actually, you know, as I always say with politicians, I'd rather they actually had consensual sex than try to fuck the whole fucking place over. So, you know, at least they all wanted it. Well, yeah, they're they're partying until it went bad. (laughs) Until it went Uh, soft. So so right now, do you know who Sultan Kujan is? He's I would love to know. He's the. World's tallest living man, not the oh, tallest yeah. man ever. He's in Turkey, and he stands at a whopping eight, eight foot three. Whoa! Yeah, it's pretty tall. Um, now, now uh, the tallest ever was uh, Robert Wadlow uh, of like Illinois, St. Louis area. Uh, you know, Western Illinois. Um, Giant Titus. Yeah. Yeah. Eight, yeah. Eight foot eleven. He lived at twenty two. It didn't really last long, but. Sultan Kojan is being challenged. <laughs> There's a guy in Ghana that claims he's nine, nine feet. Holy and holy. and the Guinness Book of World Records, you know, it's complicated if you're from Ghana and you're it's not like you, you the guy's loaded and you can't just fly to get measured. So so the so the thing is it's like the Guinness Book of World World's Record is kind of planning to fly down there to confirm is complicated, but that's in the running right now. Just just to let the world know that that's that's in the running. Well, now, Tim, if if you were to enter the world, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records, I wonder what that would be for. Well, I've I'm actually technically in the Guinness Book what? of World Hang Records. On yes. Now. Wait, yes, come I, on. Give up the goods. You, you know that story, right? I don't. I don't know everything. Come on. That's why we're still hanging out. Oh, my God. Tell that's me. like that's like another episode. Hey, uh, that's a long story. Well, but, maybe we'll come back to it. But we got to that. Let's have a cliffhanger. I, I, I can't wait to hear that. One. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not it's me as a, in a group and it's not like uh, 
Tim Dahl isolated. Yeah, it, it's such I, I can't really. It's involved. All right. Well, look, we're going to have to get I'm going to I mean, yes. you might have to have that just as uh, the, the full next intro. It, it started out with me being manipulated into suing you who the beverage uh, Dr. Pepper Incorporated. Oh, yeah. Finally, yeah. And, it, and it went viral. It's a, such a long story. And I didn't want to sue it. My, my friend, ah, it's a whole other story. All right. We'll and I got a lot it. of hate mail for it. It was really insane. But it, but it's, it went viral. If you want to look it up, Tim. Well, Dull. Tim. <laughs> Tim Craig you Yu and sued Dr. Pepper. I didn't want to. I technically changed this mass produced drink um, ingredients. I, it's well, you know, that might be time for another lawsuit. That's all I'm saying. I, know, I'm, I mean, I'm not even that litigious. Anyhow. Well, um, um, I am. But who, so who <laughs> you are? Well, there you go. Uh, I don't need to talk about the California I love floods it. right now. I, oh, I mean, it, it's it's not over. We can't even. Oh talk no, no, about it's it. just like sitting on the whole bomb state. cyclone. I mean, beyond. It's we're so lucky. Look, gallons. where we sit, we are so lucky. There's been two minutes of snow. It's not been that cold. Oh no, but, but you know, this is the. I think we either broke the record or we are about to in New York City for the warmest, the, the, the longest duration without accu- accumulated snow. So I'm not like against it. Flags. So I, I think the last time there was any accumulation, it was like March last Perfect. year. So well, we might we're, be uh, we're going to be up in the snow zone in February. Maybe we'll see some of that dirty snow piles piled up in Buffalo when we get there. Well, Buffalo, I mean, but Montreal, I mean, we, we, there's a Who lot knows? of those. I mean, look, a, a month is a long way away. We have no idea. Well, anyway, let's get on to this episode, shall we? Sure. Um, this is, after all, episode number 183. And we have Kelly Deal of the breeders and Kelly Deal 6000 and Frodo Martyr and also Josephine Wiggs, the multi-instrumentalist who's played with the breeders and Dusty Trails. And oh, they both done a ton of stuff. They have done a ton of stuff they're... and they're going to supply, going to supply some chuckles. This is the Lydian spin episode number 183, Tim Daw, Lydia Lunch, Kelly Deal and Josephine Wiggs. See you later. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spam with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our special guest today, Kelly Deal of the Kelly Deal 6000, the Breeders, Proto Martyr, guitar player, singer, songwriter, scarf maker, um, knitter, <laughs> various, various other fun things. And Josephine is just about to uh, come on in. Josephine Wiggs, yes. Josephine Wiggs, multi-instrumentalist, also playing with Kelly now, her band, The Dusty Trails. What's very interesting, and well, well, this is like a mid-period thing, is that, Josephine, you recorded a song with Emmylou Harris. Yes, that's right. And then, Kelly, did you sing with Chris Christopherson? I did. This yeah. is kind of amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Because let's go back in time. I mean, the breeders, what I guess differentiated the breeders is, first of all, I wanted to ask you, did you ever listen to Santo and Johnny? Yes. (laughs) Okay. As a guitar player, we do love. Um, The breeders had, you know, post-punk, but melodic, some rough things, but they were tending to go more toward singer-songwriter type music, which was interesting for that period. Uh, considering you started like in the early nineties. Right. Um, Yeah. We didn't get a lot of, I don't know, you know, we grew up listening to stuff like, you know, art, art rock, Ah. Hmm. you know, art pieces. Hmm. Um, And and so that was kind of what our inspiration was. Also we're from Dayton, Ohio, myself and my sister are. So we listened to bad blues, country music, whatever was happening around Pro- prog rock too. We had this conversation and, <laughs> and, and just, I mean, basically Midwest radio and yes, uh, exactly. Ru- Russ, Russ belt. Well, you know, as another Russ belt, baby, hello, Johnny cash, I think was the first music I ever heard. Hello. Exactly. So that a lot of, that, a lot of different stuff. So it's like, I didn't get my, I don't think we got our inspiration from any one place. Um, and the idea was always to try to write a, well, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, is to write a song and then deconstruct it and then rewrite it and then deconstruct it. And just to keep doing that until there was, it, there was no like 
inauthentic moment in it somehow that you weren't like, if you were sitting there listening with somebody else, you weren't just immediately blushed in shame because of some weird lyric you threw or something. <laughs> Uh, well, see, I, I always liked it if the audience was blushing with shame, but that's just my take. On <laughs> nice. See, I should have done that. I take on things. Well, I don't I, know. I, I mean, I always found like, especially if I don't know if you guys were writing as just individuals and coming to the band or did you guys write collectively or come with stuff? I, I, I know with band writing versus just an individual that there's a different process. And I always found with band writing, there is that filter of well, everyone's got to get through this. Everyone's got to put their part in. They kind of have to add, it's particularly arranging, I guess. So it does kind of filter out the shame. It's like it stands the test of time because you're just constantly going well, through also, it. Also, Tim, excuse me. also, Tim, excuse me, but when it's your sister or your twin, that's got to be even more bizarre. Or yeah. is it not? Or is it, or is it not more bizarre? Is it more natural? It's, it's more natural because we started so young in our pair, you know, in our bedrooms, at, you know, in the parents' house doing it. So that was clear to me, but it is interesting. I'm gonna let Josephine talk a little bit about how, how weird it is to come with ideas versus just fleshing out arrangement ideas. It's strange, like Kim is the prime songwriter for sure in the Breeders, but you know, if you ask me and Josephine, I mean, we came up with all the good parts, obviously. You well, know, that's why you had to do the Kelly D, uh, the, the, you know, your, your, the Kelly deal 6000 and various other things. I mean, yeah. you have to branch out always. And now, Josephine, you play a lot of different instruments. What's your favorite to master or bastardize? Well, I have to tell you that if I was to do it all over again, I would play the drums. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I so think would I. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Drums is the most fun. I, and I think that partly because you're so busy all the time, like each of your limbs is doing something different. It's a little bit like juggling. That, that even if you're even if you're playing something really simple, the fact that everybody else is relying on you to keep it together, keep, it kind of keeps you in a present <laughs> it, it, it means that ordinarily uh, often drummers are terribly overlooked i think sure well they're also in the back now they're in the back <laughs> they don't get any of the lead guitar love that's Help. true yeah but they always get to look at the ass of the lead singer or the bass player or the guitar player so at <laughs> least they get that benefit i'm not hey. sure that, that I'm not sure that that's a good thing. <laughs> well, it depends. Local, local hero from Ohio, Bootsy Collins, he compensates by having a million pedals and doing his little river dance on it by keeping all his limbs occupied. But that's not the typical uh, job of the bass player. That's something special, I guess. <laughs> no. So do you, I mean, what's stopping you from playing the drums now? I mean, I do, I, do, I do play drums. I do know how to play drums. I actually do really love the bass guitar. Um, so you're a rhythm section person, basically. Yeah, I am. It's true. And, and Although she also plays cello, and I wish she would play ooh, more cello. Ooh. Love the cello. Yeah. Uh, in breeder songs. I would love for her. But then how do you tour with that? Jesus. I mean, the same Good problem point. with being a drummer. Who wants to carry all that shit? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, well, that, that's a whole other thing. I, I, I have to say, one time, Weasel Walter played the bass and the drums in a two-piece, me and him, Teenage Jesus concert one time only. And that was like just having, that was just so ridiculous. And, and it is so much fun. I, I can't even imagine anyone else wanting to do that. Yeah. But it's possible. You played them at the same time. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Teenage Jesus had only one drum anyway. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so I'm going to ask this question to both of you, and obviously it's going to be a different answer. Any concerts that just like knocked your socks off? as as a developing uh youth uh that just like oh my god that, this that is made you me. say i have to get on the stage next yeah i think the one of the formative things for me was actually not a concert it was a record um and i when i was very very young there was a, a store in the town that i grew up in called david's bookshop that was also a second hand uh, you get secondhand records there and and I as a you know like I was probably 10 or 11 something like that I I bought several Beatles albums and I would say they were the first records that I ever bought 
Um, but when I heard the first seven inch I ever bought was uh, Rebel Rebel, David Bowie. And there was. Some- you remember what was on the B side of that? I'm pretty sure it was another top notch song. Right. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember what it was. But there was something about that that it was kind of, there was a kind of a sleaziness to it. And, and of course, it was much looser than, uh, you know, there was a real precision to what the Beatles were doing. And, and, and it was very different. And I remember being very struck by how different it was and really liking it. And, um, and, and I think that's what made me want to, to get an electric guitar. I actually did start out having an electric guitar. Well, what about you, Kelly? I mean, we're talking like, you know, very young kid, like yeah. before you even picked up the an instrument. And did you pick up the guitar first or did you pick up the bass first? And drums. I was a drummer. Drums. Oh, right. Drums. I picked yeah. up the drums. Because yeah. no, you're asked to join the Pixies and you're yes, like, exactly. no That's way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what I remember I saw uh, the Carpenters came to the oh, Ohio State okay. Fair. Nice. They choppered in. They were like choppered, choppered. Chopper oh, they're one of the biggest acts of their time. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And um, I mean, I was super young, but, and, you know, she sang, 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 sang. And then she sat on this drum set and she played drums and it blew my mind. And I was, oh, my God, I want to do that. And so I started uh, playing drums. That's how I started with the, you know, the school band. And then I took, you know, private lessons and, um, you know, ended up playing. And that's one of the things I do wish I had kept up with that because, you know, that would have been probably a good idea. But what happened to me in the meantime, in high school, you know, <laughs> oh yeah, et cetera, I saw, it was a concert. I saw the movie, The Song Remains the Same. And Jimmy Page, you know, everybody wanted to be Robert Plant or whatever. For me, Jimmy Page with the bow and Moby Dick. (laughs) And the sound, you know, we talked before about pedals. And like, you know, I'm a huge fan of any kind of, you know, distortion and feedback and reverb and delay and just creating sound, whether it's through vocals or keyboards or... um, guitar and so that that's all I wanted to do you know I remember Kim asked me when I was invited to be in the breeder she said what instrument would you like to play and this is I didn't know how to play guitar not a lick not a chord nothing I didn't say I want to play guitar I want to say I said I want to play lead guitar <laughs> yeah yeah nice yes. you know what you want you know what you wanted to do yeah oh yeah Love it. Yeah, it's my fave. Who, who besides Jimmy Page, who are named five lead guitar players oh, you can God. love? I want to know this. I, I I mean, it's it's endless. I mean, I get it. Yeah, the the first Chili Peppers dude was amazing. Who's the guy? Hillel Slovak. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Um, who played? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I'll say okay. Mick. I'll say Mick Ronson. No, that's a good one. By way, band. Hey, here's the thing, though. When you start going, remember, I grew up in Ohio, locked in, and there's there's only so much blues based lead guitar I can handle, and then I got to say no thanks. So if you start like edging in, I would much go with. I'd much rather go with um, something a little more abstract. The, the guy. Um, I was trying to think of this before. Um, you don't. You don't. The guys at home, <laughs> the at home, and I think that if not made for great Gang men. of four. Yes, Gang of Four. Yeah. He's one of my favorite lead guitar players. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. I, mean, I could not fucking remember the name of that band. Well, for for Midwest kind of class, well, it became classic rock. I mean, let's be honest. Now, of course, this was saturated in the radios. Eddie Van Halen's pretty avant-garde. I mean, that's really far out, even though maybe that's become a little banal in terms of what that fed and what that bread i could never get past david lee roth i have to say it <laughs> <laughs> that first record was so exciting it was like brand new music just the way it was recorded and stuff that was a super exciting album oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I would i would agree but after that i just it was like kiss or something yeah <laughs> Too cheesy for you. Awesome. 
What about oh, you, Joe? Wait, wait, wait. You just said too cheesy and she said kiss. Uh, con- con- contradictory. <laughs> <laughs> a kiss Roar. can never be too cheesy. Hello. <laughs> Josephine, um, as, as a multi-instrumentalist, I mean, so you went between the Beatles and, and Bowie quickly, which is Bowie. interesting. Well, Bowie, Bowie, Bowie if, you're, if you're English. And, but um, cons- what was the first instrument you picked up? And then did you just progress? Like, I need to expand. You know, I, I can't fit all I want to do into one instrument. I, well, I, the very first instrument, as Kelly mentioned, was the cello. I started having cello lessons when I was six. And um, and then after hearing Bowie, I decided that I wanted a guitar. But at the same time, this was when I was like, I don't know, 12 or something. Um, there were two things that I really wanted that year. One of them was an electric guitar and the other was a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why I thought you were going to say... I don't. I thought you were going to say nitrous oxide, but that was just me. <laughs> well, I don't even. I have no idea. That's and far out. strangely enough, they both cost the same amount. They were both each was thirty pounds, which of course, back in you know whenever it was nineteen seventy two or something, was a lot of money. And my father said, "You can't have both. You you've got to choose. You have to choose one." And at the time, I chose the electric guitar. Now, I mean, imagine it, if you would have chose the parrot, you might have become a ventriloquist. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, but they both, you know, if it all goes well, they both last a lifetime. Like parrots live fucking that around. That is so true. Yeah, I got, I actually did get a parrot a few years later. So, um, but anyway, so I got an electric guitar. The first song I learned to play, like many thousands, tens of thousands of other people, was House of the Rising Sun. Right. Which, of course, tutors you in the art of the blues progression. Kelly Deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, but I really didn't like the guitar. I didn't, I did not, I just didn't like it. It's partly because it was a, it was kind of a poor quality guitar. And it really is true that when you're a beginner really get get the best instrument you possibly can because it's so unrewarding playing a, crunchy, a shitty crunchy crappy. instrument yeah. so yeah. unrewarding and awful especially when you're first learning i mean that's yeah. super fun to play later to figure out yeah. what can what sounds can i make with this yeah but like when you're first starting out it's just awful because you just want to sound like what you hear on a record or something yeah Yes, and it's and, painful. And, it it, it kind of it hurts. It's it's difficult to get it to make a good sound. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, starting on bass because I have to give bass lessons, and and I, I'm actually one of the few bass players that never learned guitar. So yeah. so so starting on bass, that's that's like that's kind of hard to teach a beginner because it's harder for them to kind of hear the song. They're not strumming along yeah. and no, just and just doing a bass, just playing a bass part. So. You got to find a drummer pretty quickly to kind of yeah. really encourage them. I wonder if if your early like kind of love affair with those Be- Beatles albums. I always think of the Beatles as more bass driven than guitar driven. Actually, I, I always think of. I mean, maybe just I'm a bass player, but Paul McCartney always kind of feels like he's really dragging them over the finish line. You know, the of- only the only thing I ever think about with the Beatles is the White Album. That's it. I can't go any further forward or back where they drive okay. me nuts. <laughs> OK, well, Lou Reed would agree with you. Um, <laughs> well, I wouldn't agree with Lou Reed about anything except, you know, I did like some of his music, especially Kicks from Coney Island, baby. But carry on. But but anyway, so so right around that time, my my sister's boyfriend, my sister, I have a sister who's a year older than me. And her boyfriend at the time was super into music and was kind of at the cutting edge of what was going on. He was the person who introduced me to listening to John Peel, for example. Oh, right. Had, oh, had mandatory the- John oh, Peel. Right. Just broke so many people. Such a good ear for music. I mean, there was no real American equivalent on the radio to John Peel. That's no. it. And in fact, it was at Floyd's house that I first heard your records, Lydia. I, well, that must have put a hole in your ear. <laughs> I remember he had he had Teenage Jesus and the Jerts. He had uh, Queen of Siam. He had the 1313 record. 
Well, there you go. That was enough. And 400 songs later, who the hell knows? I know. So, <laughs> Thank you. so John I'm, Peel was amazing. So it's a it's a real honor to meet you today. Uh, well, I think having you too been familiar with what you were doing. All Maybe we should before. start a three piece drum corps. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That'll be hellacious. <laughs> we can all have one one drum each. <laughs> so he also, as well as listening to John Peel and kind of the what was going on at the time was a huge Pink Floyd fan. Ah, and so that's why he was called Floyd. Exactly. That's that is why he which Pink, Pink Floyd. Floyd. I was thinking there's like, I always feel like there's multiple Pink Floyds. Like well, the early Pink Floyd was, has nothing to do with later Pink Floyd. He, he, it was the early Pink Floyd. It was uh, yeah, of course. Sid Barrett era. Yeah, that's the better stuff in my anyway. So he played the guitar and he said to me one day, You should get a bass and then we can play together. Ah. And and then he and I formed a band. That was the first band. And did you get a good bass that didn't discourage you? Actually, it was it was not bad. The bass I got was not. It wasn't a partic- It wasn't one of the you know top five brands, but it was it was a very nicely made. It's bass. better than the guitar. Yeah, for sure. Kelly, what was the first guitar? I mean, look, you, you were kids, whatever. But yeah. what was the first guitar you got? And also, what is your favorite guitar now? I mean. Well, my the first guitar I got was actually a bass guitar. Oh. And it was a what do you remember, Joe? What was it called? It was the uh, was it an Aria? It's the Aria Two Pro. I mean, yeah, those are those were classic. And I mean those the, a lot of the Japanese ones of, of the seventies were actually better than the American made ones uh that were, you know, at that point Fender had been bought and resold and all, all that stuff. But yeah. Yeah, I got, I got that at a thrift store and um, or, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And actually, Kim took that guitar to Boston with her. And that's the guitar she played. Uh, she played that guitar in the Pixies for many years until or however long until she got other guitars. But she other bass that, guitar, other bass. What, hap- what about you? I, You're sitting there without your, what happened then to you? What about you? She takes off with your guitar. Well, that's bass. all right. That's all right. I actually your, with your bass or your, she took wait she took off with your bass. Your, your bass, bass. Yeah, yeah the, right. the Aria Two Pro. Yeah, okay. the Aria Two Pro. And um, she, uh, I, I had a straight job. I was working at defense contractors in town. Yeah, so I was like a pro uh, technical analyst or program analyst. I can't remember what it was called. This is in the eighties and nineties. Um, uh, because For most years. musicians should have or have to have a day job. Hello, something else. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Hello. Hello. So, um, Unless you're from England, in which case you could be on the dole. Half only, oh, half right. only. Which is, of course, the reason why England was such a hotbed of musical right. innovation, because people could be in bands. Yeah. yeah. People were collecting 30 quid a week on the dole. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> which you could live on in those yeah, days. Exactly. That's true. Yeah. All right, so your bass is stolen by your sister. She takes off and yeah. she's now playing in the Pixies, which yeah. you don't and want that. When I joined the Breeders, I have I have a couple, I have several guitars. I have a Strat um, that I love, and then I have um, a Les Paul that I love, and um, and then I have a Mustang that I oh love. yeah I have those three, and then I recently what did I get Joe? I got a Jaguar. Joe was here with me, which I cannot use in my house because the the wiring in my, in my house, I can't even turn on an amp with it. It just goes, <laughs> it's awful. But I can I can play it anywhere else in the universe. It's never too late to have a noise band. Oh, well, God. I can't stand noise bands, but I am for the most I part. like some. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know you do, but whatever. You know, I didn't have a guitar when I started Teenage Jesus. I actually wrote a lot of the songs on a three-string bass. Oh. I had to borrow a guitar. I didn't have a guitar. Somebody had to tune the guitar. Yeah. But I still have a guitar that Robert Klein of the Voidoids and Lurie picked out for me back in the day. A, uh, like a Squire, a, Fen- a Fender Squire. And okay. I never used any pedals because I just had to get the sound with the Fender amp because I didn't know <laughs> that pedals even existed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, I know, and I still don't care. So where okay. is this? Where is this Aria Two Pro now? Yeah, funnily enough, um, the you know the Rock and Roll Hall. <laughs> you guys are gonna shit. The the Rock and Roll Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, I knew that. And so at some point, it was years ago. Um, they asked for some 
paraphernalia and, and ephemera. Donation, donations. Donate mm -hmm. just not to keep, but to, okay. to display in some mm. sort of, you know, Pixies related, you know, Breeders Ohio band kind of thing. And so it was hanging up in, and she wasn't using that base anymore, but it was a hanging up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for many years, which when I think, isn't that the weirdest thing ever? That's just really strange. It yeah. is. You should get that thing back because those Aria 2s are pretty good. I thought you were going to yeah. give it to Josephine because, well, <laughs> I, I, I still want to kind of go chronologically, but let's kind of jump ahead for a second here. Breeders are doing a 30 year anniversary. anniversary. Uh, 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 yeah, and so, so the two of you are going to start rehearsing soon or? Yeah. And where's well, that going well, to Well, wait. Well, first of all, you're going to release uh, the album with some unreleased tracks, right? Yes. Which now, is not, who's I'm putting not, that? Who, Who's putting that out? 4AD. Okay. We're working with 4AD, which is where The Last Splash actually uh, was released at, at right. the beginning. And of The we, Last Splash, which is yeah, coming. Last Splash, 30th anniversary this year. And so there are some stuff, you know, because we're not just going to, here's the album, here's a different cover. There's some some unreleased material we're going to add to it. But I'm not going to, I'm not sure, so I'm not going to say what's in there. But if it's what I, what I think it's going to be, it's going to be pretty cool. Where are you guys rehearsing? I mean, not specifically, but where are you? Like, what's state? Any address? Do you no, no, no. But I mean, like, do you I mean, like everyone's scattered around. Like, yeah. Like, I mean, do you all live in different cities? I well, don't. Three yeah. of us live in Dayton, Ohio. Me, okay. Kim, and Jim McPherson. And okay. um, Josephine is currently in. Wellfleet. Hey, where? Wellfleet. Where? Wellfleet. Wellfleet. Wellesley. Wellesley. Okay. Yeah. Never heard of it. <laughs> Do you know Cape Cod at all? Cape Cod, I know, I know. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Cape Cod. What brought you there? That's an interesting. Uh, the fish. Well, the for for years, I lived in New York City for twenty years, something like that. And then in twenty seventeen, I decided that I either had to get a regular job, a regular full time job, or I had to move out of the city. Because it was it was just too expensive, and so now there's a huge infestation of great white sharks in Wellfleet, right? Well, no, <laughs> I don't know. No, not infestation. It's probably more than there were, just because the seal population. The seal population, yeah. well, better than the huge infestation of rats in New York City, and I oh, hear that I, Curtis Sliwa is as 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 is, is signing up to become the rat czar. Oh, that guy sucks. <laughs> that guy sucks. <laughs> but he he had the same idea that I had. Just get a bunch of feral cats and dogs and send them out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. So all right, well, so everyone's kind of in in the Eastern time zone, so it's not going to be. So basically, so basically what happens is I, because the three of them are there and our rehearsal space is there, uh, when we get together, I either drive or fly out to Dayton in order to rehearse. And then we set off from there doing whatever it is we're doing. Kelly, have you ever lived anywhere other than Dayton? I mean, did you live in L.A. for a while or did you move around? Or Yeah. Yeah, I lived in um, Los Angeles. I worked at Hughes Aircraft out there. So I um, I lived there for a year. Yeah. And then I um, uh, lived in Minnesota. I went to treatment, went to rehab up at Hazelden in okay. City, Minnesota. So I was up there. Uh, and then I ended up just relocating because my dealer lived behind me back here in Dayton. And I thought, you know what? It was recommended. <laughs> I, I was in treatment for a month and then a halfway house for three months. And then, you know, it was recommended that I like not move back home like that. And I was right. like, yeah, at that, by that time I was sufficiently brainwashed in a good way, at least for me, um, that I was like, okay, yeah, that's probably a good idea. I probably shouldn't move back there. So I, I stayed in Minnesota till 2001. And then I've been in Dayton since then. What's up? What's going on? What's in the water in Ohio and opiate addiction? I, I don't understand it. it. No, it's literally one of the hot spots. It's I don't yeah, know what. Yeah. I, I don't know. So, well, you congratulations that uh, you've uh, managed to manage that. Thank that's, you. Because Thank that you. is I not that most people don't come back. <laughs> no, they don't. don't. Come out if I, if I, because of fentanyl, if I hadn't. I oh, my God. Horrifying. I know. D.E.D. -D. Yeah. But the thing is, the folly of youth will lead us down many a dark path and it becomes a choice whether yeah. or not at a certain point we're going to jump off that path 
mm-hmm. and not brainwash, but brain cleanse mm-hmm. ourselves into something else because, uh, well, it's, it's too late for us to die young. Yeah. <laughs> <They're> true. <laughs> true. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll true. just say we're still here after we are yeah. still here. And I think especially and I'm, you know, of course, as sexist as anybody else. But I just think it's very important for women, especially 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. What does it matter? I used to say 30 years ago, 40. I would be the oldest living woman of rage on the stage. And now I'm absolutely it's actually coming fucking true. But yeah. I, I think it's very important for us to represent the progress, the stamina and the continuation of doing stuff, whether we've taken whatever, whatever's happened in the interim. And, you know, we haven't been sitting with our hands up our ass, well, maybe some other time, but some of us have been knitting and making scarves and records with other people. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Josephine. So how did, so you were in the breeders before Kelly was right. Yes, that's right. So what was that? How did the breeders even form? I, I don't even know the story. It it came about, um, well, my association with it came about because I played in a band, a UK band called The Perfect Disaster for a number of years, made uh, two or three records with them. And what year was that, Josephine? I think it was, well, it was in the sort of late 80s. Okay. And we did shows with the likes of Spaceman 3 and Jesus and Mary Chain. Yep. And uh, we supported the Pixies when they came over to the UK. What what instrument were you playing in The Perfect Disaster? uh, Bass guitar. Okay. Yep. And... uh, so that's how I met Kim was because we, uh, the Perfect Disaster, did some shows with the Pixies, and I in the, in the UK, in the UK, in London, okay. yeah. And um, consequent to that, somebody from 4AD telephoned me to say that Kim had a project that she wanted to put together and wanted to know if I would play bass. And then arranged uh, for me and Kim to talk on the phone. And by the way, 4ED, just to give a shout out. I mean, I don't know if you dealt with Ivo, but they put out so many great records. They and, really and they're have. still dedicated. Yeah. And they're still dedicated to the cause. They really are. Yeah. No, they are. They, they've had some superb records. Um, but anyway, so Kim and I spoke on the phone. And of course, I said to her, I don't understand. Why don't you play bass? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why you, why you're asking me to play bass. And and she said, I don't want to play the bass. I want to play the guitar. <laughs> Hello, he's a guitarist. So, you know. so basically, at that point, it was it was it, she and Tanya Donnelly from Throwing Muses had written a whole bunch of songs, um, and. Yeah, yeah, some of them were co-written. Um, and where were they at the time? Were they in Ohio at the time? Where were they living? I think they were in, well, Throwing Muses were in Boston. And I, I. Kim was in Boston. Yeah. yeah I think it was, okay. Boston. So, I mean, you're in the UK, they're in Boston, come and be in our band. What about it? Basically, yes, but but you see, the, it started off as a record. We were just going to make this okay. record with the songs that they had, that they that they had demoed. And in actual fact, they came to my house in the UK. Uh, (laughs) Honey, make them come to you. I say, make them come to you. They wanted you, clearly. Because um, Tanya at that time had an English boyfriend. Mm. Uh, Oh, complications. And so this, this period of time when Tanya had time off from throwing music and Kim had time off from the Pixies, Tanya was like, okay, yeah, we can do this, but it, we have to do it in England because I've got to spend time with my boyfriend. You know, I'm going to be in London. What, what year was this? Just what year was this, Josephine? This was 91, 90. It was actually it was at the very end of 89. Okay. So basically, what happened was that him and Britt Walford, who was the drummer in Slint, came to my house 
in Bedfordshire, England, and we rehearsed at my house. And then we drove down to London and rehearsed with Tanya for, I don't know, three or four days. And then we drove to Edinburgh. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, okay. So what, eight is, hours? Uh, yeah. That's a long drive. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is about eight hours. Yeah. So, um, and who was going to put it? Who was paying for this recording then? I mean, did they have a deal? Thank you for AD. So, yeah. so Ivo knew the guy whose studio it was. It was in his house. It was, a, it was like a 24 track studio in this guy's house, which meant that we all lived in the house. Tanya said that it was like a slumber party, like the recording of the album was like a You know, which, party. by the way, historically with rock records, a lot of times that's how it was. Yeah, exactly. Go back to Led Zeppelin or even the Rolling Stones. I mean, I'm talking big rock bands and, of course, much smaller ones. Often that's the way it is. Yeah. Slumber party and get on the tape. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. I say we should all just have a slumber party and <laughs> secret recordings and then... See what shakes loose. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Were Kelly's lead parts put on later? No, Tanya played the leads on. So Todd. you just you so you learned them and joined the band and hit it when it was like a fixed. Well, there was this weird period of time that after Pod was re released in um, like January of 1990, and that um, was the first record. Yeah, that's the first record on 4 AD. Yeah, um, Kim Kim rejoined touring with the Pixies and Tanya continued, I think, with um, throwing the muses at that time. She did, but, then, she was, but she Tanya was already at that point thinking on of, her way out. She was on her way out and going to yeah. make so, Billy. So then about a year and a half later, something like that, sometime in 1991, the five of us. So that would be myself, Josephine, Kim, Tanya and Brit, right, met up in New York City and we did an EP called Safari. So, I mean, under the title uh, of The Breeders? Of this, uh, yes. And right. so at that point in time, both Tanya and I are actually on the record together, uh, on the EP together. And, and th three guitar players at that point, right? Yeah, exactly. You, and then why going, not? Le and, going Leonard why Skinner. Not? Going Leonard Skinner, exactly. We had never <laughs> done a. Um, we had never done a, and I think Tanya was only there for like an afternoon. So she just, did, she was, she was busy um, organizing her, um, her album under belly. I remember her saying, what should I, you know, kind of talking about what it should be called, and, you know? So um, the, the band, which she ended up calling it belly. So then at that point we had never, uh, readers hadn't done, really hadn't done any, touring or any shows to speak of. So we, that, that after that, after Tanya left and then the four of us started playing, we got uh, Jim McPherson to, to play with us. And, and the record play. was coming out or had come out or how did that, I mean, so how did EP. that happen? The record's coming out, you're going on tour. Yes. EP. EP. I think it, it was after that EP, wasn't it, Josephine, that we got offered the Nirvana, Nirvana gigs? Nirvana tour. Which yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, how amazing is that? But I mean, what year is this again? Because we're Nirvana huge yet? yeah 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 no. like not, i mean they were no? just kind of breaking. just breaking yeah. okay. 91 or 92 i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> who can was <laughs> that was that fun was it devastating was it amazing was it rough how was it that tour it was really exciting um it, it was my first touring ever so uh myself and the drummer jim we i mean jim had played plenty of shows but i had never played any shows as a guitar player. So well, this we, was my time. Go we ahead. had done some touring before then. We had done oh, yeah. own... We did do an American jaunt, didn't we? Yeah. How, how did how did you tour with the Nirvana thing? Where did that go? And how how were you getting around? That first that first one was really short. It was just um we did a show and then they we did two shows supporting them in Ireland, right? Wow. And that was mm -hmm. kind of the end of that. And then after that, we did. We ended up touring with them a lot more. We just were in a car and stayed in a hotel. I think I don't remember. Which no, people have to re not. which people have to realize a lot of times we're in a car, we're in a van, we're on the train. That's how we do it. We still do it that way. Some of us, hello, yeah, Hi. yeah, right. I I don't remember that at all. When we no, when we toured with Nirvana, we had to have a bus. 
Were you, you all on the same to... bus? We were not on the same bus. Did no. you have your own, like, like a Nightliner bus or, you know, what kind of bus? Like the, 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 the tour bus. The tour yep. bus. Yep. yep. Because... Well, wait, there's a tour van and there's a tour bus. Uh, we never tour on a tour bus, but we do tour in a tour van or a so tour bus. That's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, my God. How much fun is it to be on the tour? Uh, how much no. fun is that? <laughs> It's fine. I was usually just so drunk. You just bleh, head to the head to the bunk and make sure your feet are facing the driver. So you don't get Gloria Estefan. Uh -huh. you know? We were talking about that the other day. Yes. Yeah. So you got to do that. All right. So you're on the tour bus. How many shows did that encompass? And where was that with her? Oh, that first one was that just literally just those two shows. But <laughs> um, when, when we toured with them later in life, later on in the next few years, we would always have to use like a tour bus. I mean, Lollapalooza, fuck, you couldn't do it. I mean, unless, I mean, somebody has to drive. You got to drive through yeah. the night. You got to drive through you the night. You have to go through the night, otherwise and you can't keep up with the schedule. Yep. Yeah, and you know, it, you, people don't like eight hours to Scotland. Who gives a shit? That's nothing. Right. That's nothing <laughs> in the United States, you know? I mean, there. Uh, you, and the thing is, I mean, the thing is, you, countries. it's not that glamorous to have a tour bus because you're sleeping no, on it with a bunch of other people, as yeah, opposed yeah. to if you're a smaller organization like we are, we can actually stay at Airbnbs or hotels because we are all in a car. Yeah, Josephine would much rather have. She's like a cat. She needs her space. She needs to shower and her tea. She wants that. She doesn't want to do the bus life. You don't no, want to no. smell right. like a dirty boy no, on the I'll tour. Put it down. No, I have it down now. I oh. I like the tour bus. Oh, tell me how you how you're. I right. like it because because it means that you arrive first thing in the morning. Everybody else is still asleep. The one drawback is you do have to. There's a kind of zen thing that you have to get into because you have to just be prepared to wait for the person to arrive who's opening the venue so that you can get in and shower. Okay. Now, now, Tim, was it Charlie Watts that said 25 years of waiting, five years of playing? Yes. <laughs> It's something but in this case, it's waiting. <laughs> it's waiting so that I can go in and shower, get dressed and start my day. And and sometimes it, it's really infuriating when the person's supposed to be there at 11 and they don't show up. Oh, yeah, that. And I'm sitting there waiting because I want to go to the art museum in Prague, you know, or, you know, like going, you know, it's there somewhere like, oh, you're, okay, you're right. You, I have my day planned. I want to go and see some art, know, some art, some, some still lifes from the Dutch Golden Age. Art, architecture of the cemeteries. What else yeah. is there? Come on. So, I mean, but, but, the, but the Sprinter Tour, you know, it, culturally, you are in a hotel in a city where the fucking the Nightliner tour bus, a lot of times you're in the suburbs in a mall fucking parking lot. And it's just like. And you better be making those bucks because it, culturally <laughs> it's a little uh, it's like a desert culturally. A so little bit. let's update that and say, how is the new breeders 30 year anniversary of the record, the record coming out on 4AD uh, for last splash? How are you going to be touring that? Where are you going, honeys? Uh, probably a sprinter for sure. <laughs> you know, we're uh, the buses are so expensive. They're so expensive. Exactly. It's ridiculous. You, you know, and Danita I, Sparks was saying because she was asked to do a stretch during the Danita. peak of Danita. Oh, during the peak we of, love her during yeah. the peak of COVID, and a lot of more. That's like, hey, do you want to do this stretch? And they're like, the Nightliner is so expensive that if anyone gets sick every day, we're going to take such a hit that she's like, I, I kind of can't do it. It's too risky. No. You know, are you, are you talking about getting sick from COVID, you mean? Well, yeah, this is like, or whatever, like yeah, yeah. a year and a half ago because yeah. they would cancel everything. And then you yeah. have the you still have to rent the tour bus oh, every yeah, night yeah, that yeah. is when, through the roof. All right. Like, so how, what's the what's the deal deal? When, what you doing when, when we go out when, like when I go out with the, the with proto martyr, it's like no testing. I'm like, Donald, we're all like Donald Trump. No testing, no cases. We had nobody tests. <laughs> well, there's see, now you can do that. Before, there's actually, they forced you to. Uh, oh, yeah, by yeah. the way, I test all the time. Negative since 77. Thank you very much. <laughs> For syphilis? Are we talking about Honey, oh, never oh, had oh, that, oh. but trust me, I might have to go to the GYN just to get an update. Never had it. <laughs> never had it. Never had it. 
Okay. Never had it. I've had COVID twice already. And what I about got syphilis? Well, I don't know. Syphilis, I'm zero. COVID twice? Yeah, because of touring. You know, I mean, I've been touring, but I don't know. I just think I could be patient zero. I'm not sure. Well, good for you. I mean, maybe you even had it. You didn't know you had a super oh, that, light face. That's that's what we are wondering. I'm yeah. never I'm never sick, but I'm always in physical pain. I would trade it to be sick for one day. Whatever. Oh, that's sad. Not, not a, no biggie. No biggie. No biggie. No biggie. Okay. So let's talk about the upcoming tour. Where are you going in your sprinter? <laughs> Joe, where are we going? Well, the first the first shows that we're doing this year, I nearly said next year, and then I had to remember. Oh, my it is God. next year. It is it's next year. year. We are playing at the Innings Festival in Tampa, Florida. We're and we'll do some sort of shows around that, too, to yeah. get there and back, you know, but we'll just kind of take a sprinter or something down there, you know. You cut, you're coming up to the Northeast, or is it all? But then... Yes, then the, 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 that's, that is, that's a festival that's just, you know, that's the first thing we're doing this year. Festivals are good. Then the, the record, the 30th anniversary special edition, special, special edition record <laughs> is, uh, that's coming out at the end of August. Okay. Yeah, probably the idea will be um, to... Uh, start booking a tour for the fall in order to coincide. As, as I like to say, get the hose on the dance floor. Women have got to play. We got to go on the road. It's what we do. And, we, going. you know, we're hoping, we're hoping to do a full U.S. tour on the back of that and hopefully go to Europe as well. I mean, do you, do, do you find in the past that, I mean, I mean, for me, at least, I don't know about you, but Europe, I mean, since I started going in 77 or eight and forcing myself there every year, every two years, I mean, it's where I can get the most gigs. It's where I make the most money. It's where I get the most respect. But I mean, is that different for you? I mean, is, I mean, do you have, did you have more attention in America because of the period you came up and then also the Nirvana or the Lollapalooza connection and the proto-martyrs and your other individual stuff? What's it like for you, America versus Europe? You know, it's a good question, Joe. I think... I think partly because of 4ED being a UK label and people being super familiar with it. And also because the back in the day, the music press in Europe was so different than it was here. There were so many more publications that were covering contemporary rock music. And, uh, and so the people, I feel like the audience were more on top of it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas here, it all seemed like a little, you know, until it actually blew up, it was more of a cultish kind. Of, it was more cultish and um, rarefied in a funny way. I, I mean, it's very hard in this country. People don't understand. Like, they might think, oh, you know, your name, the breeders, the attention, the whatever, the blah, blah. But they don't realize how hard it is to actually tour in America. It's very difficult. It's very, you know, exhausting. I mean, when we go out, we go out for, it could be as short as four or five days to maximum two weeks because you can't do the whole country unless you're in yeah. a bus and you have some support and you really know what you're doing. It's just too, too vast. And whereas in Europe, I mean, you can just do a longer tour conveniently, either on a train, in a, in a car, in a van or flying. It's just the way it is. Typically the places that you would play that would be hosting you in Europe, they're going to be, um, uh, uh, sustained, what's the word? By like the city. Grants, yes. right. Grants better food, Something better like treatment. So they and feed you and they, we're vegan and this guy can eat no fat at all. Okay, we've got you covered. You know, it's <laughs> just got off a tour like that in Proto Mortar and there was this beautiful food, gorgeous backstage where everybody could shower and stuff. It was really beautiful, really nice. They were so happy to have you. When you joined so, Proto Mortar, I mean, that which is just recently, right? Right. As a pandemic broke, uh, but as, you, as a live touring act, I want to ask you, is that must be really fun? Because a lot of the music is much more aggressive. So is that where you can get your hard rock rocks off? <laughs> yeah, it is really fun. Although I'm not. Yeah, I'm kind of 
a lot of times what I'm doing is supplementing with, which is really strange, just, you know, talking about like where I came from with the idea of sounds and soundscapes and filling out whatever. So a lot of what I do is actually that kind of thing through vocals or guitar. Um, keyboards as well, right? And keyboards, exactly. Now, obviously there's still loud, here's the loud guitar part on the chorus and I come in loud with a distortion pedal or whatever. But there, a lot of that is just creating like sonics to kind of simulate psycho, psycho ambience, right? Yes. Drive it. Did you say psycho ambience? That's what I call a lot of my background music. Yeah. Oh my god, it's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly. Or uh, what do they call it? Um, Tam- tambral uh, digital uh, alchemy, drama. digital oh, well, drama. Yeah, there's that too. Better digital yeah. drama than uh, emotional trauma. And let's face it, we've all had it. <laughs> exactly. Kelly, I, Kelly, I have to ask you about mm-hmm. the last hard men. Oh my God! Yeah. How the fuck Woo. did that band form? And and for the people that don't realize it, the lineup is Skid Rose, Sebastian Bach, uh, Smashing, unbelievable, Smashing Pumpkins, <laughs> Jimmy Chamberlain, Jimmy uh, I mean, of the Frogs. I mean, what, what? What? How did this happen? I was in rehab. <laughs> ah, okay, all right. That explains it. All right, yeah. I was gonna say. On. I had just left rehab actually, and I was looking to do some music, and um, I was. Oddly enough, I was reading a spin magazine and I saw this um, this article car called something about hair metal or the hair bands. Where are they now? And I'm flipping through and I see this picture of Sebastian Bach. First Which, by all, the way, he was pretty hot. But what band did he come out of? Skid Row. He was cute. Yeah, but I mean, or a hair I'm boy. not a hair metal band. I'm just not. I don't even like it in a funky ha-ha way. I don't like it at all. Yeah. So, but anyway, so I want to establish that is that's because it makes it even more interesting why I thought that was cool. So my my relationship to the, what I felt when I saw his picture and it's a picture of him just sitting on a bed and he looked completely like, fuck. Cause I remember when the Kelly deal 6,000 went out and it was our first tour and we rented a bus and it was a big deal. And we got a really good deal on the bus because it was one of Motley Crue's oh! 12 buses that they owned and were sitting vacant, sitting idle. Ah, because bro. hair metal had just gone. Yeah, their, their overhead was insane. And it was uh, yeah, just draining so their funds. All these buses and you could rent this bus super cheap. So how did it smell? It was fine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that was so that was one of those things. I had just kind of had that experience of like hair metal. And I remember feeling like, you know, he, he lost his, his, and he got kicked out. I mean, Skid Row broke up and I, nobody and, cared. And a flurry of hair and makeup. I don't know, <laughs> glitter and makeup, but, uh, hair, I don't know. But they, um, so they busted up and I just had and such an empathy. Well, and spandex, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, but I had such an, you know, this empathy for him and looking at like, fuck. Did you volunteer? So I, I, did I what? Did you volunteer? No, you so formed I, it. she formed I, it. I got a hold of him. I, I knew uh, this guy from William Morris and I said, hey, can you get me in touch with Sebastian Bach? I'm, I want to do a, a, you, a know what? you are weirder than what it appears. And I love you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. So, yeah, so we did that. And let me just say two things I'm quite honest about, because people always ask me about him. He is one of the funniest motherfuckers I've ever met. He is super smart. He, he is really cute. At least he was back then. No offense to age, et cetera. Mm-hmm. He had a beautiful voice. I mean, it was a really lovely voice. And then uh, having said that, he's also deeply like bipolar and has depression or something else going on. Can you so, give him my phone? Can you can you give him my phone number? <laughs> <laughs> can you get him on the podcast? Yeah. Can you get him on the podcast? Thank you. <laughs> oh gosh. Why not? God, put it out there. Well, that would be a biz- Lydia Lunch hey, interview to- Sebastian <laughs> Bach. Hey, I have never heard one of his songs, but I'm willing to investigate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I'm willing. Like I'm very. A male I'm very, version of you. Oh, only. Oh, my God, baby. Oh, my what? God. Well, yeah. wait, are you suggesting a three way? Oh, God, no. Oh, I didn't I, think so. I'm sorry. No, Excuse me. That I mean, was rude. I'll, I'll just sit and drink some tea. Josephine and I will drink tea. You and can we'll watch. Maybe we'll film it. Hey, it could be yeah. the new. T- hey, 
Bring them on, honey. Bring them on. But, but, but Lydia does have bipolar. She's actually very steady. So, so maybe. Yeah, she's... but I mean, most of my friends are. I mean, yeah. hello. I, I've just completed a documentary, Artist Depression, Anxiety, and Rage. Most of my friends, those miserable cons, have problems. Send Sebastian to me. Maybe I can sort him out. Yeah. Bend over, baby. I'll do the driving. He might be fixed in the morning. So, so uh, but, but, real quick, but real quickly, because I, I want to move on. I mean, that band existed just. A, did you guys ever tour? Was it just like a, a record you put out? No, and it just again, like you know, from you know, see above, like it wasn't really sustainable, you know. We so, did, uh, did appear. He got invited to co-star in a strange movie. <laughs> in a movie it was filmed in New York, and he was the guy who played the Riddler in the Batman series. Frank. Oh, oh God! Wait, wait, wait! Chief Ledger or Joaquin Phoenix? No, no, the old. The original uh, Batman. Oh, for the, the TV by, show. Okay. Okay. By the way, by the way, the new Bat. The, the, by the way, the new Joker comic has Joker impregnated. I, I really, the Joker has been impregnated in the new comic. But wait, go back. So Sebastian Bach got invited to be in a movie with the original Joker from what the TV series the or TV, his name is Fred Frank. Gershwin. Fred Gershwin. Yeah. Yes. Is that him, Fred? Frank? Yeah. Frank Gershwin. Frank. Frank, Frank, Frank Frank Gershwin. He was amazing. Gershwin. Okay, yeah. Gershwin. So he was in there. And is it called something about shampoo? And it's a murder thing. It's like a, a terrible murder thing. And it was kind of jokey. And I mean, it would be hard for me not to murder Sebastian Bach while I was giving him a shampoo. <laughs> but I would not do that. That is not in my name. He nature. had beautiful hair. I bet. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So it looked great <laughs> on my mantle. <laughs> we were the band in the background during a scene ah, so, okay yeah. and then jimmy flimian had his from the frogs he had his wings on and baz is out there going hi ah, ah, and I, I i i mean look you brought it up i'm gonna say you said uh he is like the male version of but i've never heard that before i gotta get sebastian bach yeah. on this show i'm leaving it yeah. to you honey bunny because it's gotta be done okay gotta be done <laughs> i'll tweet him and by the way, I consider myself the choker, not the joker. <laughs> oh, God. I love the jo I love the joker with Joaquin Phoenix. I think it's an amazing film, by the way. Anyway, well, whatever. I've never so, seen all it. right. The tour is coming up. The record is being re-released. For, uh, first splash is last splash. I mean, is coming out again with unreleased tracks. We don't know what they are. You're looking for an August or fall release mm -hmm. right now. Let's talk about your scarves. So, of course, I mean, look, we're crafty. Women are crafty. Yeah. So yeah. you make scarves. I looked at them. They're like two sided scarves. And that's just because we have to keep our hands busy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really thing, uh, something that happened from this long perception of me being in Holland uh, in Amsterdam, particularly, and I just gotten sober. It was my very first tour, and I'm, you know, there are lots to get in trouble with in Holland or in Amsterdam. And I'm just like, this was in the '90s. There's like two television programs on, you know, uh, and I don't understand the the language in either of them. And there's just like, what am I going to do with myself? I, I make voodoo dolls. You make yeah. scarves. It's what we do. We got to have you a craft. That. That's fantastic. I, by the way, this has a steel pipe in it because if you can't curse him, you can kill him. Yes, thank you. Maybe we could trade a scarf for a voodoo doll. <laughs> ka <-ching. laughs> But so, so you started, you started, started out of rehab. It, and then I just started creating things and then selling them at like in um, Minnesota and Minneapolis and stuff. And it just kind of morphed from there. And then I was making them, I started recycling sweaters, but then it got too fucking hot for sweaters. And nobody wants wool around their neck. So I started experimenting with flannel. And I just, I like making stuff. I do. Yeah. And that's I love I making stuff. We got to have hobbies. I mean, we got, yeah. hey, devil's workshop. What can I yeah. say? Got to do it. Yeah, exactly. I love it. So they can, people can order scarves on kellydeal.com. There you got them up there. Go ahead. Why not? Records are coming out soon. In the meantime, just there is enough history for people to go back upon and investigate. Because we are nothing if not her story in the music of alt rock, alt yeah. everything, basically, because we're all freaking weirdos. Yeah. And I really thank you both, Josephine Wiggs, Kelly Deal, multi instrumentalist. Um, 
singing with Chris Christopherson and having Emily Lou Harris sing a song, which is just so bizarre to me. Yeah. Love it. The Breeders, uh, Proto the Martyr, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, excuse me, uh, Dusty Trails, which is amazing. I like that vibe of Dusty Trails. I did kind of a desert blues record too, but it's very, I like it because it's like, I call it kind of Sunday music. Mm-hmm. Dusty it's Trails, great. it's Sunday yeah. music. It's something you want to hear Sunday afternoon. And it's a two piece with the other gal who was in Luscious Jackson. Yeah, Vivian um, Trimble. Right. And, uh, and I love two piece, three piece bands. It's amazing. So ladies, thank you so much for being on this the Lydian spin. Happy New Year. Happy Dusty Trails. And we'll be in touch. We'll be, we'll be in touch. And uh, well, Josephine, for up in Massachusetts, we'll let you know. And I know I know uh, Dayton is two and a half hours from Oberlin, but we'll let you know either way. Well, the show is early. You can always drive over. What else you got to do on a whatever night it is Wednesday <laughs> night? Come on. I think you'd Thursday. like it. Thursday night. Thank, thank you. you thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really great. Yes. Yeah, thank you guys for having P- us. Pleasure. Pleasure. 